What time of the year is it over there right now? Is it winter? Uh, we are moving into uh, just got out of just got out of summer, so it's starting to get a little bit colder here. There you go. Yeah. yeah. All right, I might kick things off. Uh, we're bang on nine thirty, so may as well get going. Uh, everybody, welcome. Uh, yeah, officially welcome everybody to our, our LinkedIn live event. Uh, the complete strength and conditioning coach with Ron McKeefrey or Coach Mac, powered by Lumen Sports. So thanks for thanks for joining us, Coach. Oh, I'm excited. Thanks so much for having me. No worries. Before I sort of go through your very uh, extensive resume and a, a bit about you, I sort of I'll just introduce uh, the meeting and the format before we properly think kicks things off. So originally, the reason we put this conversation together was to really pass on some actionable really digestible, uh, you know, real world tips and pieces of advice from yourself, someone that's seasoned S&C figure that uh, people can take back to their environment and genuinely put into practice. And more so looking at the, you know, the well-rounded S&C coach rather than just in the weights room, uh, which I know you're passionate about. So think everybody less plyometric progressions for sprinting that we'll be chatting about and more, more of a holistic kind of S&C success. So, Ron and I will chat for about 35, 40 minutes. Um, and then, yeah, if you have some questions, chuck them in the comments box and we'll ask a couple of, couple at the end. But I'll, uh, I'll do a bit of an introduction for you, Ron. You've probably had a lot of introductions in your career, so I'll try not to embarrass you too much. But Appreciate uh, very, very extensive resume, um, big S&C figure in the, in the college world. So you've been at U University of South Florida, University of Tennessee with the Cincinnati Bengals. Eastern Michigan University. Uh, you're currently at University of Washington. I think you've been there since about the beginning of last year. And uh, you also spent a fair, a decent amount of time at, at play. Um, shout out to Mick Steely as a mate of ours at, at play. So you were there in performance and education, which I know you're super passionate about sort of bettering the SNC industry in general, which you got to do there, which we'll get into in a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, couple of your accolades, twice named collegiate uh, SNC coach of the year, first by the Professional Football SNC Society and also the NSCA, master strength coach for the CSCCA. Um, and you've got a few others, but I won't, I won't sort of take up the full 40 minutes with that. But Appreciate that's, that. that's, uh, that's kind of your weight room resume or, or the technician side that you kind of call it. But where the other side of your career, I guess, is where you're maybe even more so a huge figurehead and influence. You know, you're in a, you used to have a podcast called the Iron Game Chalk Talk, which you've since moved over to Isaiah. I think you had almost 300 episodes, maybe over like seven years. Yeah. So that's, all right. right. Um, you do a lot, you do a lot of talks at, you know, NSCA, CSCA, CSCCA and ASCA, Australian. It's given us some love, but you're probably most well, well known for your books, two number one Amazon bestsellers in the CEO strength coach and, and the weight room wisdom, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit as well. Um, that must have been fun to make, actually. The weight room wisdom, for anyone that doesn't know, it's kind of uh, some stories from 99 of the top S&C coaches. I, I just imagining you around the campfire with some S&C coaches just sharing yeah, some that was the case. Yeah, I think, you know, that book was, um, you know, we do so much, uh, you know, with the team of trying to coach the whole athlete, not just, a, you know, not just be a complete strength coach, but be a complete athlete and, you know, we got them for two hours a day and they got 22 hours to mess up everything we did. Right. So yeah. you're trying, to, you're trying to coach them up to be better people and use stories. And, and so I often found myself asking other coaches for stories that they would use. And, uh, and I would put those in and said, this has got to be stuff that we share. So that's yeah. where that came from. Very nice. I love it. It's a good idea. And then the CEO strength coach will talk about a little bit about that, about that with the technician and the, and the manager and the uh, entrepreneur side. But, I guess yeah. To start things off, what's um, what's happening in your world at the moment? Like, how's how's personal life? How's work life? Uh, what's taking up most of your focus? Yeah, I appreciate all that, and excited for uh, to be here and uh, to to uh, talk shop with everybody. I think, I mean, I, I identify first and foremost as a as a husband and father. You know, I've I've got three adopted children from the Ukraine. You know, and so obviously all the stuff that's going on in Ukraine right now is heavy on our hearts. Um, and, uh, you know, there, we got them when they were five and three, we got, um, two twin five-year-olds and a three-year-old when we got them, they're 23 and 23 and 21 now. So, um, 
you know, they're, they're definitely well, you know, attentive to what's going on and, uh, little people, you know, and, and, uh, and so it's, it's been great. We've, we've moved to Seattle for the university of Washington here. Uh, we had a great season this last season. We went, uh, t- took a team from four and eight to 11 and two quick turnaround. Um, but it also came with obviously all the challenges that come with taking over a program and building relationships and figuring out where to turn the lights on and all that. So, um, I think ultimately I had five days off last year and we played December 28th and we were back to work on January 3rd. So, um, wow. yeah, it's been, a, it's been a whirlwind year for sure. That must be a, a bit of a struggle considering how much, you know, importance you put on the family side of things, having that little, little time off. Sure. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think the, the biggest thing about coaching and family and, um, and all that is that you have to, you, I mean, for you to do it at a high level, you have to include your family. And so, you know, my family, my daughter actually just left. She's, she's doing an internship with the program right now on social media and the creative. So, I mean, I try to get them around as much as we possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. And I see the, the Huskies football team are kind of flying. They won. I just checked. They won seven in a row. Uh, haven't lost at home. I don't know what you're doing uh, at the ground there in Seattle, whether you put in some, some chewy in their boot or something. What's happening there? We'll, we'll take whatever we can get for sure. Yeah, yeah we, it's a, it was a great year for sure. Yeah. Got to turn around, you know, flip the calendar though. You got to do it all over again. Yeah, exactly. Back to back to back. Um, all right, before we get sort of stuck into the deeper, a little bit spicier content, I guess, a uh, couple of quick fire questions. I'll start off. Um, favorite favorite read that's helped you in the S&C world um, and also favorite read unrelated to S&C world probably should ban you from picking your own books, I think. Yeah, no, please do. Um, <laughs> you know, I, think, uh, I don't read much fiction, unfortunately. Yeah. Boring that way. Um, I think the best, you know, the Chip and Dan Heath um, have a number of books that I feel like are, you know, in my top five for coaches to read. And so, um made to stick uh it's about kind of giving sticky presentations decisive is about the decision making process power moments is is about elevating everyday moments um but probably switch which is all about changing culture um is probably the my favorite book um and one that i use the most often with just kind of what i do and um you know, I think, you know, obviously being a strength and conditioning coach, you go in and you're the first, you're the first boots on the ground, you know, a lot of times when you take over a program. And so um, a lot of what happens in the culture piece is, you know, is, is you're doing either good or bad. And so uh, that book has been very insightful for me and I've drawn upon it quite a bit. Um, I love anything by, you know, Patrick Lencioni, um, John Maxwell, uh, all good books as well. And um, I think, you know, as we talk about some of these other things, like Raising a Modern Day Night is a good one for family. Um, so, yeah, some good books. Good selection there. I like it. Uh, favorite favorite podcast? And we'll probably apply the same rules as not picking your own. Um, you know, I like, I, I like Ryan Holiday's. Um, I can't remember exactly what he calls it, but it's, you know, the, all, the stoicism – um, I think it's just a Ryan, Ryan Holiday uh, uh, show, but uh, I really, that's probably the one that I listen to the most. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm a big Rich Roll fan. I like, I like that podcast. Yeah. Uh, one thing you'd change this is probably a pretty long question, but maybe we'll get into it a little bit later. But one thing you'd want to change about the S and C industry? Um, I think the biggest thing is probably just evolving the role. You know, I think, yep. you know, it's it's still within its first hundred years of existence, you know, um, and so uh, documenting that like through podcasts, through writing books, through sharing information, I think is super important for all of us, you know, especially all of us that's listening. Um, but I think, you know, figuring out how to, you know, the lifespan of a coach, just because so much of it is is still undefined, you know, how do you define a good strength coach? It's still up in the air. And so because of that, there's volatility in the market. And whenever you have volatility, you have very good coaches that sometimes are out of work that need to be, that are highly skilled, you know, mm. and that's kind of where the CEO strength coach came from is I, I you know, my, my, my 
thesis was, you know, if you did anything else, you'd be the CEO of a company just because of it takes a, mm. a, a lot of character. It takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of motive, you know, the ability to motivate and, you know, uh, push the, push the envelope. And, um, you know, those skills, if you, if you did it anywhere else in the business world, you'd probably be a CEO. Yeah. I like that. I like that viewpoint. I think probably S and C coaches in the beginning or still, still are, you know, just judged on, wins and losses or strength testing numbers when in reality it's uh, as you said before you're a huge sometimes the, the boots on the ground you know most of the time you spend maybe the most amount of time with the athletes so you have such a huge you have such a huge influence on both the culture and just the growth of the athlete personally um you know as a human being rather than just a, as a as a lifter as a mover so yeah Absolutely. i like your, like your thoughts there and then last one this is probably a contentious one so you might have some comments streaming in on this but uh all-time sports goat oh man yeah. um i'm a big dan gable fan i'm a wrestling fan um you know i wrestled in high school i think i mean just going through you know going through and being undefeated throughout winning a gold medal um just um you know to do it in a, in a tough sport like that you know such, such a physical sport such an individual sport where you can't rely on your mates i mean um i think he's probably up there all right that's i'm not gonna lie it's pretty niche uh cool but i'll take it you're the you're the expert so that's good um all right i, I want to talk firstly a little bit about how you got into s and c i was listening to a podcast that you were on a little while ago um and i just love the story i know you've probably told it a thousand times but i do i do think it's important firstly because we've got a lot of australian um attendees here which uh, who probably won't know you as well but secondly i think to me it, it, it encapsulates a big part of who you are how you got started and how you got to be so open helping others in the industry um you know giving your time back to younger coaches being that mental figure just genuinely saying yes uh, a lot of the time and you know, I think that was demonstrated when I, I reached out to you on LinkedIn, just said, hey, we're a sports tech company in Australia looking to expand into the U.S. market. And you kind of said, all right, let's let's have a chat. So um, I, I think that's kind of your mentality in a, in a lot of that side of things. So uh, if you could kind of indulge us on, on that story, how you got into it and what kind of fulfillment, I guess, you get out of uh, you know coaching or what you were searching for in S&C coaching. Are you are you talking about the story when I was a kid? Or are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I apologize for those that have heard this, but um, you know, long story short, when I was a kid, I grew up relatively rough, um, single parent, five kids, not much money, um, and so I'd often walk myself home from school, kind of on the busy streets, and um, you know, to get home and wait for my mom to get off of working multiple jobs. And one day there was a drug deal going bad. And so I went a different direction. And what I did, I came across to high school, you know, in a high school football field and not having a lot of money and, you know, not having played youth sports really. And, and those types of things, I was just blown away by this football practice that I was witnessing. And, uh, you know, being eight years old, not having any boundaries, I decided to walk right down the middle of the field in the middle of practice. And, um, you know, there was a coach that very easily could have told me to get off the field and cuss me out or do whatever. Instead, kind of walked me to the sideline and let me watch practice. And that one split second decision by that guy literally changed my life. You know, it gave me a passion for a sport that I didn't even know I had. And so I often share that story because I, you know, I think it, as coaches, as people that have influence, you know, we, we have that opportunity every single day to make that kind of impact. So that guy's never thought about that one more time, you know, but for all of us and you know, for me, that was a big part of being able to change my life and, and give my kids and my wife a different life than, than what I experienced kind of growing up, you know? And so um, I think it's such a powerful profession. It's such a, a huge honor to be able to do it each and every day. Um, I try to make the most out of every single day. And so taking, you know, uh, looking for opportunities and things, I think, as strength coaches, sometimes it's easy to get, you know, narrow focused and and just focus on the task at hand. And it's it's more than a full time job. Um, but, you know, when you look for opportunities um, and you and you explore outside of this profession and look for other uh, other professions for inspiration, you know, there's so much that you have the ability to kind of 
you know, to, to make an impact in this world, both in the weight room, outside these four walls. Yeah, I love that story. I think it's just, just goes back to everything we just said already about, you know, influencing everyone you're interacting with, interacting with as an athlete, um, more so as a human first and, um, you know, the athlete performance side second. So Absolutely. Uh, I like how you can do that. Yeah. Uh, do you keep in touch? Have you, do you, do you know the coach? Do you have you spoke? No, to him? no, I wish I did. I actually tried to look him up and, yeah. um, you know, I'm just, you know, no, being in the business now, obviously I'm sure it was, a. I'm sure it was a, a, an assistant coach that was doing it, as, you know, like after the after work or something, you know, that barely, yeah. you know, maybe it wasn't even, a, you know, but, you know, that day just made a bit, made a huge impact, you know, and, yeah. you know, and I've been fortunate, like I've, you know, I've coached all around the world, you know, and, and uh, worked with the best of the best athletes and, you know, all that kind of stems from that, that one moment. Yeah. Very nice. Well, we'll, we'll kick into the CEO strength coach book a little bit because it, it does kind of give an overarching sort of um, outlook and uh, your opinions, I guess, on the S and C world and what it means to be a coach and a good coach and you know your CEO strength coach essentially. So, as a summary, you've kind of drilled into three skill sets that you you need as an S and C coach um, to be successful, I guess, or to be the best. So, you kind of broke it up into a technician, which is about you know, the craft, what everyone thinks as an SSC coach, you're in the gym, you're prescribing trainings, you're, you know, looking at testing, um, uh, that sort of side, the actual, the actual skills. Um, and then you've got the, the manager side of things. Um, you know, you're essentially looking after a, a team and communicating with other performance team members as well. You know, you've got the trainers, you've got the coaches, you need to be a good manager. And then you've got the entre entrepreneur side, which is, uh, you know, you've really obviously run with and we were speaking off air before is how do you expand the SNC role beyond beyond the weight room and beyond just the organization you're working with to be able to get into areas such as, you know, the education side. Um, you might work for a sports tech company on the side. You might do a podcast. How do you influence um, and how do you learn from others and impart knowledge from you as an entrepreneur outside of the weight room? So, um, I don't know if I did a good job of explaining that, but is that is that pretty much sort of your philosophy on on the uh, S and C sort of world? Yeah, I think you know early in my career I, I became a head strength coach at at 23 years old, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I've only been an assistant for one year since then, and um, and so I looked, had to look to outside coaches for inspiration. And so I really sat back and looked and said, okay, what are the greats doing? Cause I wanted to be great, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they were writing, they were speaking, they were developing coaches. They were, they were, you know, partnering with companies. They were doing all kinds of things that were more than just the, you know, the wins and losses on the football field. And so um, through the years, you know, I'm just through exploring, um, I came across a book called um, the E-Myth Revisited, and they provided this framework of the technician, the manager, the entrepreneur. And they really kind of, you know, they kind of equated it to like a, a plumber that was starting a plumbing business. Right. You know, and so they, they first they get out of trade school and they go and they learn to, you know, they learn the skill and they become good at it. They get t tired of taking orders. And so they go and they start their own company. But when they do now, they have to be the the, the sales, the the marketing, the the custodian and all these other things that has, you know, that you have to do. And that's where you have to learn how to manage time, people and resources. And, uh, and then, you know, you, it, your business dies if you're not forward thinking and, and, you know, continually sharpening the sword and, and evolving, you know, that's kind of the entrepreneurship side. And so I just started looking at our, our profession and said, you know, this is kind of the life cycle of a strength coach where, you know, you know, typically, you know, you start off in this business and all you can think about is sets and reps and progressions and regressions. And that's all you talk about. And you know, it's almost like clockwork, you know, you get new interns in and that's, you know, they got their exercise libraries and they, it's all, it's the latest and the greatest. Right. And then all of a sudden now they become a head strength coach. And now you have to manage time and people and resources. And it's like, man, the bullets are flying at you, you know, mm -hmm. and you're, you're, you know, and that's often what ends up happening is people, they, they, they went to school to become a great technician. They had exercise mm -hmm. physiology and biomechanics and, and on and on and on, but they didn't have, you know, classes in leadership and budgeting and some of these other skills that you have to be really good at to be a, a head strength coach. And then often what would happen is, is you get, 
either ran out of the profession from father time or, you know, you decide that it's not, you know, working 80 hours a week isn't what you want to do. And, and then you go open your own business as a coach and you end up failing at that because you don't understand the business side of things, the entrepreneurship side of things. And so mm-hmm. it was this life cycle. And, and what I started thinking is that's, that's a very reductionist line of thinking is that you've got to do one you know, you have to be good at one and, and, and continue to develop into the others. I think you need to be good at all of those, you know, and and do them while you're coaching and work at them while you're coaching. And if you develop all three of those, and you become great at that. I think you can have a long, prosperous career in strength and conditioning and, and one that you don't have to deal with a lot of the pressures like, you know, what happens if I lose my job or, you know, those types of things if you have some of these, you know, these things in place to be able to handle and weather those storms. Yeah. I think there's a couple of things there. I think in any, in any industry, really not just S and C is in recruitment, there's been a huge push towards, Hey, let's not look at what they did at university. You know, everyone's most people probably have the right accreditations if they're going for that job. Uh, Let's look at their experiences. Let's look at the way they present themselves. What do they have uh, outside of the, you know, non-negotiables, I guess you can call it, um, and how do they expand and how they want to explore? Are they are they wanting to, you know, expand their uh, sort of view in, in the craft that they want to get into rather than just looking at the accreditation side of things? And I think in the S&C industry, it would be, it would be tough because you're, obviously it's got a very big reputation for the, the hustle side of things, time poor, um, and it's pretty probably pretty easy to say, "Hey, I don't. I literally just don't have time for all the things you're talking about. I, I just have time to look at the reps and the sets. And I, if I do let, if I do focus on some of the other stuff, I'm going to let some of the reps and the, and the sets slip. So I think that would be a a tough thing to sort of juggle and balance. So maybe maybe for the entrepreneur side, for example, you've obviously you know, really dialed that in over the years with your books and your podcasts and everything. But if you're really at the beginning of that journey as an SNC coach now trying to maybe go down more of the entrepreneur path, is that purely just reaching out to some random companies, uh, asking to help them out with blogs? Is it, you know, reading? Is it writing some notes on your own own journey? Or is it trying to get a, a bit of a side gig? Or, you know, what does that kind of, what does that first step, I guess, look like? Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, in some degree, I think there is a life cycle there that you have to, you have to make sure that you, you have a solid foundation, right? So you have to mm-hmm. first make, to be able to continue to work at the job that you work. I mean, if you start working and doing side gigs and you're terrible at your co- at your job, mm-hmm. you're going to have it very long. So yeah. I think you need to make sure that your technician is, you know, that your technician and your, your rock solid there. I think where you start probably most coaches is really with your time management. Because if you're going to do any of these types of things, I mean, I literally, you know, I get here at five o'clock in the morning and I leave about seven o'clock at night every night. So that's about 14 hours a day, six days a week, you know. And so now is every minute of that on the floor coaching and, you know, and and at practice and those types of things, it's not. And so there's there's gaps of time. And if I'm really, really efficient, you know, that I can find some areas to be able to do maybe some some side things or, or those types of things. Right. And and so I think you know, when I'm nerding out, when I'm trying to, you know, when I'm falling asleep at night and I'm trying to find ways to get better on YouTube, like I'm, I'm looking for time management skills. I'm looking for tools and resources that are going to help me, you know, like notion or Trello or some of these other tools to really be able to, to make my time efficient. And that's, that's why I'm able to write a book when I'm working 80 hours a week, you know, and get that done or, or do a podcast, you know, and be able to, to batch that in, in spring breaks and things like that and have that be dripped over, you know, eight weeks or something, you know, while I'm coaching all day. I think that was the, that was probably the most frustrating, frustrating and, and, and funny part of that, you know, th- those, those projects has been, you know, there would be, you know, there's no shortage of haters when any, anytime you put yourself out there, yeah. and people would think, well, does this guy even coach? And I'm like, dude, like, you know, just hang out my shoes for a day, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, and see how much I'm coaching. And I think that's probably the first place. And then, and then, then you got to figure out like, what, where do you have passion? Cause I think anytime you take on an entrepreneurial type of journey, it's got to be something that you're doing purely. Uh, you have a, there's got to be a purity there first, you know, and, and something that you don't feel like you're working 
it's, it really was like, you know, writing those books or doing that podcast really was like, it's a hobby, you know, more than anything to me. And, um, you know, when you do that and you, and you kind of set up yourself, you know, like, you know, doing the podcast set up book sales to the point where I was able to go to number one, you know, like, you know, you built a, re, a an audience that was like, okay, what, you know, what can I buy from you? And, you know, you put a book out there and all of a sudden it goes up, you know, you do those things, those kind of things, you'll have, you know, I think you'll have some success with those little mini entrepreneurship projects, you know, and I think what, you know, more importantly is if you just start kind of putting yourself out there, I think there's a lot mm-hmm. of strength. Just, I mean, I wrote in my book that if, if you would have told me, you know, this is probably 15 you know, years ago, if you would have told me you would have sent me a tweet, I would have probably punched you in your face. Like, I think it was the dumbest <laughs> thing in the world, you know, but, you know, but now seeing how you can use social media in a really powerful way, you know, or, you know, I mean, how many times have I walked in and just because I have a high Twitter following, I've got instant tre- street cred with my players, you know, mm-hmm. like that stuff can help you you know, in Mm. this, in this business. And so finding ways to use it and tap into it, you know, being able to reach out to athletes and send, have them send messages to your athletes. Like, you know, when you put yourself out there, you're able to do that and you're able to make your, your current job better. But then what ends up happening, you know, like some of these opportunities that you mentioned, people would seek you out, seek me out. And, Mm. you know, and then just being a guy that, you know, rarely, you know, would would look for the yes led to some pretty cool things. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's a couple of things there. Like what you said about, you know, you can't let the technician side slip away. You really got to nail that. Otherwise, if you try and get in the other side of things, it's it's just going to fall apart. And the second thing is, if you if you try and do, <clears throat> excuse me, if you try and get into the entrepreneurial side of things just for the sake of it, um, just because you, you know, uh, think it's the, the cool thing to do or you think it's the great thing to do because uh, Ron McKeefery told you to and you're not, passionate about it if you're not passionate doing anything i mean it's not going to come across genuine it's not going to uh, be authentic and you're probably not going to be successful in it so i think they're probably two really good points points you made there um and then sticking probably with the entrepreneur probably it's, uh, probably a combination of the technician and entrepreneur space if we talk about tech for a second um you know you've probably seen you, you have seen a, a wide variety of technology come in, come out, do, uh, you know, fads that work, some that don't. Um, so I'm just interested on your side, how, how you go about that process in terms of, you know, anywhere from researching, from selecting something that you want to implement, uh, how you implement, how do you get that buy-in from the athletes? Do you tell them that you're, you know, who the company is and why you're doing it and, and really focus on that why and um, get input from all the other coaching staff. I'm just kind of interested in, yeah, you know, that, that whole entire process from, from your point of view and how you go about it. Cause I know a lot of other coaches struggle with, you know, heaps of tech out there budgets, obviously a, a, a constraining factor. That's just how it is, but choosing the right option can often be pretty, pretty tricky for anything, I guess. Yeah, I think, um, I had a coach that I worked for at the University of South Florida for 10 years that, you know, was, you know, at, at that time we were starting a program from scratch, um, literally, you know, started the program out of trailers, you know, on a campus and built it into a division one program. And, you know, money was tight, you know, anything that we tried to do from a strength conditioning perspective was really tight. And so there's no shortage of technologies at any point in any stage in, you know, these decades or these, or these careers and, I would bring him things all the time, you know, a new squat rack, a new whatever, you know, GPS, whatever. And the number one question always out of his mouth was, will it help us win? Like, how is this going to help us win? You know, and so that becomes the filter even still to this day is like, okay, are are we going to make decisions that are going to help us win football games with this being in our weight room, you know, and uh, with our athletes and being able to justify that, why it will lead to wins, you know, or could lead to losses, if we don't have it, you know, is probably my, is the filter that I use initially. I think from there, I think practicality, you know, in, in the weight room and, 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 and being able to um, implement something into a fast pace. I mean, I only have eight, these guys for eight hours, you know, of like organized training, you know, and, and so being able to implement that in a fast paced environment, I really got to understand it from a practical and how it's implemented. And so reaching out to my peers, seeing how it's been used, seeing how 
uh, they've made that process efficient is probably the second step for me. Um, then, you know, I always, you know, anytime I introduce anything to my athletes, if they're going to put something on, like I always tell them, I'm not going to make them a, a human lab rat, you know, like we're going to, we're going to make sure that there's, you know, that there's a purpose and, and things. And so I always make sure that there's social proof, you know, like who else is using it, what athletes do, you know, everybody has a muse. Everybody has an athlete that they look up to or program that they respect or something along those lines. And so I try to find those key stakeholders in the program, whether it's, you know, the starting quarterback or the head coach or the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the position coach that has, you know, a lot of opinions or whatever it might be. And I, I find out who their muse is and I try to make sure that I provide some social proof to get those key stakeholders on board. And then it's usually a pretty easy process to get to get, to get it implemented. But, you know, um, I mean, obviously, this it goes kind of without saying of doing the research and making sure that it, you 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 believe in the product, you know, and that you can speak confidently and um, about it, and that you trust it and believe in it. Um, I think that's kind of a, a, a given. Mm. And I think the other thing to mention is every every athlete responds to that differently too, right? Like it's not a it's not a blanket approach where you you're going to introduce something and every athlete is going to have the same reaction so you, you probably got to be aware of that um everyone responds to something di or change or new technology like that differently to be able to explain how it works why it works why we're doing it to somebody might take 45 minutes to an individual the other person might say oh, i just i just put it on because coach mac tells me to put it on and he's probably going to yell at me if i don't put it on and i'm pretty scared of coach Mac when he's yelling. So um, I think that's another interesting part of it is, is just, you are dealing with individuals, you're not dealing with robots. So it's always, it's always tough, like uh, navigating that, I guess. Well, I think that, you know, that's the manager part, right? The manager yeah. is, is time, people and resources and people are the hardest part. Like you gotta mm -hmm. be able to, man you gotta be able to lead up and lead down. And um, you know, and as a strength coach, you gotta be a master manipulator. Like you gotta be able to, to kind of put it in, in their their perspective and yep. uh and so i think that's always finding to me that's that's the game in it you know it's like how many different ways can i trick this guy into doing squats you know <laughs> um so that's that's the game for me um and so but some people that's like beating their head against the wall you know so i yeah I, I, I get it. yeah i guess just expanding on that a little bit um and talking about athletes and and culture specifically culture is a word that gets thrown around, you know, in the in the SNC world, in the business world, in any workplace world, and it's so hard to define and explain because it's this uh, invisible kind of visceral thing that it exists, and it's not just you don't just have good culture or bad culture. You have you might have two really successful teams that have completely separate cultures, but they're both positive and they both work. Um, and that just comes down to the fact that people are people and everyone's different and, you know, you're never going to get two cultures that are exactly the same. So my question, I guess, is you've, you've gone from a fair few organizations, different colleges, you've been involved at, you know, in different environments with the different cultures. So when you get that new role, how do you go about entering that new environment and first off saying, let me try and figure out what this culture is. Let me try and figure out how that head coach operates, that line coach operates, which athletes are the alpha. Um, and then secondly, I guess, how do you let that guide or influence your sort of coaching style? Do you try and catch up with every single athlete individually? Do you, do you call a big meeting with the performance staff? Like how do you sort of insert yourself and navigate what the culture is and where you kind of want to, uh, how you want to um, in introduce your, your craft? Yeah, I think, um, and I, I'm looking off to the side here with the comments. Like, I see all the questions. I'll make sure to answer those at the, at yeah, the yeah, end. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, I think, you know, like I said early on, I mean, part of the being here this last year is, you know, and only having five days off that first year, like, you know, that it, it takes a tremendous amount of time. I mean, you spell love, T I E, right? What you, what you love, you'll spend time on. And so, like you got to, you got to put in the work, you know, to build those types of relationships. And so um, a couple of things that I do um, actionable things, like you said at the beginning mm -hmm. is I have, um, you know, I have a, a, what we call a why meeting now. And it used to be just, a, just a meeting that I would have, but, 
but when Simon Sinek came out with his book, Start With Why, <clears throat> that was awesome, right? You know, you gave him the golden circle. You got to know the why before you can do the how and the what, right? And it was, a, it was a good framework, but I didn't think the book did a great job of telling you how to get to why, you know, and, and at what kind of questions are you asking to mm -hmm. get to that? And so, you know, I meet with every single player when I first get there, even even now, like I'm doing it right now when we had some new players just, just show up uh, for the spring quarter. And uh, I sit down with them and I, you know, on top of giving them all their performance results and their goals and all those types of things, I ask them three questions that I feel like get to somebody's why very quickly, you know, and if you take nothing else from this, if you've never heard this, I think um, the number one thing is it, it, you'll, it, you'll take this away and it'll make a tremendous impact on your, in your team right away. First thing I asked them is if they didn't play football, you know, this can be golf, tennis, whatever the sport, right? If you didn't play football, what would you do? You know, and most football players, most athletes have never thought about their mortality in the sport. They never thought about what's going to come next. They think that they're going to make it to the next level and they're just going to be playing forever. Right. And when you start to kind of figure out, they're like, Oh, I'm going to be a cop or I'm going to go help. I'm going to start a camp in my, my, my hometown for underprivileged kids, or, you know, I'm going to go into business because I want to make money or, you know, whatever the reason you really kind of start to kind of figure out like, what's their, mo what's their true motivations in life? You know, what do they really ultimately want to do? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then being able to, to use that information in a lift, you know, like I'm not a big yell or cuss or screamer. Like I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll raise my intensity like the next guy, you know, and, and, um, don't, I mean, I, there's a lot of passion behind what I do, but, I'd much rather be like, hey, man, you told me you want to be a CEO of a company. Is this is this how a CEO of the company is going to act? You know, when I ask mm -hmm. you to do this and you're and you're over here dancing at the water cooler, like, is that how a CEO is going to ask? Mm -hmm. is that how he's going to respond? It's so much more powerful when you got that little nugget that you can draw upon in those moments to be able to kind of dig in. And they know that you've heard them, but you're also like you're putting their words back you know, in front of them. And mm -hmm. second thing I ask them, what's the most difficult thing they've ever been through? You know? Like you really want to get to the root of what, you know, what, what drives people is, you know, it, it, it's usually some, some of the trials and tribulations that they've been through. And so you know, I had a player, Howard Campbell, that was a, 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 you know, when we got him, all we knew about him was that he, you know, he, he lived with grandma, you know, and that's all we knew about him. Well, it wasn't until I asked him that question that we find out that he, he had watched his dad shoot his mom and then commit suicide right in front of him. He went in it into foster care and, you know, his grandma who thought that he was going to go to the NFL got him out because she just saw kind of a payday and she treated him like crap. And it says, you know, he, they shipped him off, you know, got money for kind of raising him, I guess, for the last two years. And then he went to college, you know, and, and like, you know, like, am I going to motivate that guy by fear and, Figuring out, you know, figuring out what motive, you know, what they've been through. And that guy needs to be encouraged versus maybe somebody that's been silver spoon their whole life needs to maybe get their foot, you know, put up their, you know, it's so like you find out what you need, you know, I've never really been through some tough times. Okay. Well, I'm going to drop on that. Like, this is going to help you. It's going to help you mm -hmm. in your life. And then the third is, um, you know, who's the most influential person in your life? You know, and I, I do that for a variety of reasons. I like I want to know who that is and why that was the case, but also want to get their permission to call that person. And for you know, however long it takes, you know, for me, it's 120 players. I'm making 120 phone calls as I'm driving home at night and I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm calling them and they think that I'm calling them because something's wrong or they did something bad. And the first thing I'm telling them is something great that they did, you know, and like how much I, how much fun I'm having coaching them. And, you know, and, and uh, you know, and all of a sudden now we hang up, you know. Oh, and then, by the way, like you're the most influential person in their life. Did you know that? You know, mm -hmm. like because we're, we're really good as humans telling people that they're that means something to us. Right. Yeah. So, you know, what happens? They hang up the phone. They turn around. They call the player. And now I've got the most influential person in their life, kind of checking me off and saying, "Hey, man, that's that, that coach cares about you. That coach is mm -hmm. cool." You know, like if you don't think that that matters, you're crazy as well. So, like those three questions right there, I kind of do with every single player, and then you know, and then we have you know, we we meet at the start of every phase, 
and we're asking about, you know, like what can they improve upon? What what do they, you know, their goals changed? All you know, all the different kind of things. But I'm we used to have uh, this is more digital now, but we used to have like a medical folder that we kept all the workout cards in, you know, their old workout cards, but it had like what's their favorite color, what's their favorite movie, what was their, you know, if they were a dinosaur, what dinosaur would they be? You know, like <laughs> crazy questions. And, um, and just as they were coming through the weight room, we'd ask them crazy questions. Like what's, you know, what's your, you know, whatever, what, you know, if you were, you had to pick between two fruits, what, which one would you, would you be? Right. And, 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 and those are just things where you're just kind of getting to know the player and you're building this kind of dossier on them that, you know, they know that you know them. And if you put that kind of time and effort into somebody, um, it's a little bit easier to get them to run a little bit further, lift a little bit more weight do something for you that you need them to do. Yeah. I love that. I think that three really, really powerful questions. Um, I think, you know, we should probably, even just as companies, just set up a meeting and well, individual meetings and or chats and coffees and ask each other that. Cause as you said, like once you break that barrier down, you can relate to them as a, as a person outside of the, the, you know, college uniform that they've got on, you have no idea what's going on behind those doors. So it really allows you to connect with a, and just be vulnerable and then diffuse things as you kind of said in the last little bit there with a little bit of humor as well, I think is always an underrated thing. Uh, always an underrated um, technique is, Hey, you can still be their friend as a coach. You can still make them laugh. You know, they can still make you laugh. That's okay. Uh, and that, right. yeah, that, that, that just becomes such a powerful tool in, being being more resilient even humans um love humor as a technique to do to do that so i, I love that um I moving into the the coaching staff uh in terms of going in and assessing culture and how you go about it uh we, we were at a, a play lab event actually in sydney and we had a guy from uh, australian rules football team from the sydney swans his name was um shane shane lahane uh and I really liked his talk because he, he talked about a, a failure of his or, you know, you call it a failure, but it's really just an experience. And I know you say that it's not uh, if you uh, lose your job as an SNC coach, it's when. Um, right. I really like how, how he explained his experience because he said he really had no idea, but he lost his job and he did a bit of a review on it. And he, he realized he never, when he first went into that uh, organization, he never met with any of the coaching staff. He didn't figure out, I'm talking about the head and the line coaches here and assistant coaches. He didn't truly understand the type of, uh, not culture even, but the way they wanted to play and the way they wanted to win. And we can relate this really strongly to the technician part even. You know, right. yes, everyone wants to win. How do you want to win though? Do you want to win by being fast? Do you want to win by being agile? Do you win, want to win by being powerful in the legs, in the upper body? How do you want to win? as a head coach, what do you, what's the strategy? And he never, he realized once he went through that process, he never really aligned himself with what he was doing with what the organization and the coaching staff wanted to do. So my question is how, you know, how do you go about doing that? Are there any like little techniques that you use or is it purely just sitting down with them and saying, laying it all out there and saying, what's on, you know, what's our strategy this season? What are we doing? What do you need from me? What do I need from you? Um, let's right. get on the same. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think if you do a lot of great work, like on the front end, I think, you know, I'll give you an example. We had a, a, a coach here that came in that I hadn't worked with before, but he had, he had actually listened to, to episodes of, of my podcast, mm. you know, prior to. So, like, there was a little bit of, like, I was kind of positioned as an authority already, kind of in a, in a, in a kind of weird t- type of way. Yeah. Um, I think if you do some of that on the front end, it can help you on the back end like that as well. But, sure. um, but when I do sit down with them, you know, I think the biggest thing is you, you listen, right. You listen to what they, what they hold important. Now it's not too hard. Right. I mean, I want them, I want them to develop into NFL talent as well. So mm-hmm. all the KPIs that are important for NFL are important to me, you know, and then it's a matter of like, you no know, style of play. And, you know, I always tell people that I, I've, I've never looked at myself as a strength and conditioning coach. I've always looked at myself as a football coach that does strength and conditioning, you know, and so that perspective of like, you know, look, I'm going to make sure I know the lingo. I'm going to make sure I know our offense, our defensive schematics. I'm going to make sure that I, you know, that I'm, I'm learning the sport as I'm, I'm growing in the sport as much as I'm growing as a strength and conditioning coach as well. 
being able to provide that that feedback back to them and you know sit in on their meetings sit in their in a, uh, their staff meetings and pull all that out but i kind of go back to what i said earlier like everybody has a muse you know and so i usually find out who like they who they really respect what strength coach mm-hmm. they really liked um, or what program they really respected or they, they modeled themselves after. And oftentimes, like, you know, when I was at South Florida, our head coach was, was you know, him and the head coach at Oklahoma had worked together before, and Oklahoma had won a national championship. And so, you know, I had, you know, I was beating my head against the wall on some things, so I decided to take a trip out to Oklahoma. And, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, you know, I, I need money for supplements. She doesn't want to give me money. You guys got supplements everywhere. Can you just tell me that supplements are good? Okay. Supplements are great. And I would write it down and I would turn that report into, you know, the head coach. And now here's Oklahoma telling them that we need supplements, not just me. Right. You yeah. know, and um, I think that's, you know, being able to kind of create that social proof for, for the coaches as well. But, you know, what I, I, I tell our staff, we just had this conversation the other day, like, we're going to have, like, we're going to make sure the meat and potatoes are in our training programs. Like we're going to make sure that we, mm. you know, bench squat clean, whatever, you know, whatever the, the lifts. Right. Mm. Um, but now if our, you know, if our quarterback coach coach wants us to freaking pat our head and rub our belly at the same time, and they feels like that's going to make him a better quarterback. Well, that's the sugar. Like we're going to throw some sugar in, you know, to make our coach happy, but we're going to make sure we got the meat and potatoes in, you know? And, and so, um, I think, you know, relenting a little bit of, you know, like it's not that big of a deal if we stay an extra five minutes and they, they throw, you know, they do shadow boxing in front of the mirror. I don't, I don't care. Like if it helps great, if it doesn't, it's not really hurting anything. Yeah. I, I completely agree with all that for sure. Um, now looking at, I, I know you spoke a, bit, a little bit about having a sustainable sort of SNC coach uh, career, sorry. And I think you said, or was it that not many SNC coaches retire or something like that? <laughs> no, not everyone lasts uh, that long. And you obviously have, and while doing quite a lot in the industry as well, not just for, again, the organizations you work with, but for the industry as a whole. So how, how do you go about finding that balance between, you know, your family life, your strength, uh, your technician side, your manager side, your entrepreneurial side? Is it is it just really hustling as, as long as you can and then taking breaks when you feel it? Or do you implement measures for yourself on more of a weekly sort of basis to try and prevent retiring? Or have you even thought about uh, changing industries at one point and you thought, hey, I need to bring myself back to what I really love here? Yeah, I think um, it's a good question. I, I Ultimately, I think you you have to protect your time. There's no doubt about it. Like you have to build that in. It's something that I, I didn't do early in my career. And I do think mm-hmm. the season of life, right? I think if you're going to be mm-hmm. successful, if you're going to be successful at anything, you're going to be skewed to the right just a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, the key to that is, you know, like my early in my career, it might have been 90% strength conditioning and 10% my family, you know, mm-hmm. and not necessarily proud of that, but, but the 10%, I was 100% present. Like, I think I, you know, I would bring out my phone would stay in my truck. I wouldn't, you know, like I'd do all my work before I went home. Um, and so I think, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be a hundred percent present. I would make sure that like when I, when I spend time with my kids, when I'm dog tired and I work 14 hours, I still made, like made sure that there was memorable moments throughout, you know, that I knew that they would, they would look back on in their childhood and remember as key kind of pivotal things. Mm. I think being intentional about that and really working at your family as hard as you work at your business, I think that that's, you know, that's super important. Now the time might be skewed and and hopefully you get to more of a 50, 50 type of split by the time you get to like the peak of your career. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's important. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, in this business, uh, I think the, the, the challenge and, and kind of where the entrepreneurship side kind of evolved to is I think a lot of people get into these, these side hustles and whatnot to, to almost get out of the profession because they're, they're so fed up, they're sick of it or Mm -hmm. whatever. And to me, it's, again, it's a reductionist line of thinking. Like, I think you can do both. Like you're literally, we all live in a, 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 in a society where you can, you can make money selling, you know, sweaters for cats if you wanted to, you know, like, like there's people that make money doing stupid crap like that. Right. So like, I don't mean to be cat owners out there, but like, 
ultimately you can do money doing anything. So like yeah. you can have these side hustles and you can, you can use and you tap into your expertise and you don't have to do it where it takes a lot of extra time. Like I was already writing stories to talk mm-hmm. to my players or I was already kind of, you know, some of these like principle based philosophy, you know, um, or a chapter in my book, you know, like, you know, stuff like that. So like, I think I was, what I'm, what I try to do now is I try to make sure how do I stay in the profession? Like, how do I manage those periods of transition and have a couple of different streams coming in to where if coaching was taken away from me, you know, outside of my control, mm-hmm. then I could pick up some of these other streams to kind of to, to hold, you know, to tread water until I could find the next opportunity. That's the right opportunity, not just taking the next job, you know, and so you know, that used to be podcasting and speaking and some of these things that, you know, took a little bit more time. Now it's more investing and real estate and some of these other buckets that, you know, don't take that much more time, but take more resources, you know, early on, I didn't have as many resources. Yeah. And so I think, you know, finding what those things are and, and instead of making golfing and, you know, going out to the bars with your buddies and think whatever, as you're like your main hobbies, like make, you know, like, things that are going to protect your family, your hobbies. And mm. um, I think that that leads to a little bit more peace. Like I, you know, there's a point in my career where I was making as much coaching as I was with some of the side stuff. And, you know, where strength coaches sometimes in some organizations are viewed at the bottom of the, the hierarchy. Mm. Um, I, you know, I felt like I could walk away at any time. So it kind of gave me some moxie mm. to be able to walk around and be like, Hey, look, we're, we're, we're either going to do this or I'm going to quit. Like, you yeah. know, I'm going to, you know, and I can, I'll just go do this. And it made that life a lot better, you know, mm-hmm. to endure some of the things that you're, you're, some of your frustrations. Yeah. Yeah. I really like what you said about having different points in your career with different, uh, different balances. It's not, you know, you at the start of your career, yes, you might have to push some things, other things aside and really hustle in and, and, you know, put some personal things or even things within the SNC industry that you want to focus on, you know, over here somewhere, because that's maybe a five year time thing. And I think the important thing is, is realizing a that it's not going to be the same balance forever. Uh, and if it is, you will burn out. So you have to be focused on that. But, you know, realize what's important at the time, at what stage of career you're in, what organizations you're involved with. And then as you go through that, process or the years go on it's about flicking the switch in some other key areas and then trying to find those balances where they where they make sense because it's just you know you could sit here and say let's spend 30 percent of time on this 30 percent of time on that and then do 40 percent of time on that the whole career and that's just obviously not going to happen so i think really more so just being aware of where you're at where you're wanting to go and uh maybe putting some time frames on things if it is getting a bit hairy for a bit too long and um, hopefully you don't burn out and have to knit cat sweaters and make money <laughs> that way. But um, I got one more, one more quick thing before we get to some questions. I just wanted to we have one thing to that, just because yeah. I think, I think it's important. If you're listening to this and you know, like you can create that type of life for yourself if you want to. And I think this is yeah. something that I struggle with a little bit with like, I sound like the old guy in the room right now. Right. Or this generation of strength coach, but like, You know, if you want to make it so you're 30% family and 30% work and 30% side gigs or whatever, like you can create that business, but it doesn't really exist at high performance sport, right? Mm -hmm. You can't be at at a professional organization or an elite college program or something like that and do that, you know, but you can, like, if you, you know, if you want to work with just quarterbacks or just, you uh, you know, rugby athletes or whatever, like you can create that business for yourself you know, and do it. And that's the exciting thing about the time that we live in is those, you have that ability and and it's not, you know, like early in my career, it was kind of viewed negatively to kind of be in that performance space. If you right. wanted to be in, in high performance sport, you know, now it's like people are going back and forth and it's not nearly as much of a stigma as it used to be. So I think you can, you can do that, but you, you, you gotta, you know, but you have to have an awareness about yourself, knowing that like coaching the, the eight year old kids at the performance facility in a group setting is not the same as coaching 120 division one football players, you know, 
And so you just got to choose what you want to do. Like you're a great coach, no doubt about it. You can keep their attention. Good. You got all the certifications. Great. But there's so much more that goes into the culture piece and the mm. just the environment and all those types of things that you just you have no concept unless you're in it. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's a good addition there for sure. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, no, no. I think it's it's all gold. Um, we'll go to a question from uh, Donna. Uh, let's have a look. And if anyone else has got a quick question, just chuck it up in the comments. But this is around performance and nutrition, um, which I'm sure has become more and more a part of your your role really as the years have gone on as the importance has obviously come to light um so she says uh you know thoughts around performance nutrition um training for snc coaches so education um this is where she sees the largest variability and inconsistency to begin to close the gap so where where do you do your sort of education on that side or how do you integrate the nutritionist if you have them at your um, dispose um, and influence the, the the education for the athletes as well as the coaching staff. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a great question. I think um, I'm very fortunate that we have a full time RD. And we have we have multiple RDs on staff here, and so um, when I came here, we did not have that. And and what I know now that I maybe didn't know young, you know, in my early years is that like nutrition is its own level of expertise, you know? And so you yeah. want to get somebody that's working just as hard as that as I am at strength and conditioning. Um, unfortunately, a lot of places that maybe don't have an RD, you default to be in that, that resource. And so if you find yourself in that role, then certifications like performance nutrition, uh, uh, performance nutrition or uh, the ISSN, nutrition certification things like that things that you can get as without going to being an rd mm -hmm. i think are important for you to do at least so you have some framework to work from when given any kind of advice but um but i did not have a nutritionist here when i first got here and i gave up a strength coach position to bring a, a nutritionist with me because i felt like it was that important and and so very fortunate that the administration saw the saw the the resource there being valuable and they gave me that strength coach back but we put our strength coach we put our uh, our registered dietitian ali vandenberg in the weight room she, her office is in the weight room because ultimately everything comes down to behavior modification you know if you're gonna if you're gonna change your eating habits it's behavior modification and so mm -hmm. you're not gonna change for somebody that you're not gonna change your habits for somebody that you don't know like and trust and so if, you're, if your office is in a different part of the building, the only time they see you is at the, the occasional meal. And when they do their body fat, it's, it's you know, they're not going to change for you, you know. Um, you know, but if you're in there every single day and they see you training out there as hard as they train and, um, and you're building that relationship with them every, and they're seeing how much work you're doing and putting and trying to create different choices and options for them and, and all that, then, then you start to kind of have, you can make a really big impact and, and that's what I've seen Allie do. She's done a phenomenal job and, and uh, a key part of our staff. Mm. Uh, will we skip over the question from Mick Steely who says, how does uh, Ron McKee create keep boyish good looks? <laughs> um, oh, uh, maybe, maybe we'll choose uh, another one. He's trying to give me a call too. Um, Go on from John talking more about uh, being an executive athlete, he's called it. So business owners who want to dial in and bring more movement into their day. So not in a professional athlete environment, not in a collegiate environment, but probably just the everyday person who's working and uh, is time poor. Um, how do you, well, first of all, have you ever worked with that sort of um, industry and, and how do you see those types of people best fitting in? like movement and, and finding that education into their, into their day or into their routine. Yeah. I think it's an awesome opportunity that we need to explore more as strength and conditioning coaches. Cause you're, I mean, mm. what we do is we, we coach high performers every single day, you know, and so mm. tapping into those business owners and those CEOs and, you know, just the everyday, you know, general population, I think is there's so much opportunity there to make a, a, a even probably a more bigger, a bigger impact than with athletes, you know, people mm. that have had those resources kind of given to them, you know, a lot of their, a lot of their career. Um, I, I gave the example a couple of you know, years ago, but uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been in discussions with some oil, some oil rigs to put strength coaches out on oil rigs, you know, because there was such right. a big and, and physical job and, 
you know, mobility and health and wellness and is such an important part. You know, if you, if all of a sudden you go down out there, like you're, you're losing a work, it's not like you can get somebody there the next day, you know? So, you know, there's, there's so many opportunities for strength and conditioning coaches right. out there to tap into some of these markets. Um, I have a former uh, uh, intern that went on to be the head strength coach for the New York Yankees that is doing exactly that right now. He's in New York city working with fortune 500 C- CEOs and, mm. and he finds himself coaching as much their physical as they, as he's coaching their mental and, um, and being able to, to, to capitalize on a, the years of being in a locker room and hearing motivational messages given and using that, you know, to the everyday and, and having the credibility to abuse of being in a high performance sport to be able for that CEO to kind of leverage as well. So mm. um, I think it's a huge opportunity. I think you can make a tremendous impact and I think more of us need to be doing it. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the SNC coach firstly, just as a title is expanding rapidly, but the types of environments and opportunities uh, are also expanding in, in terms in terms of where they're actually placed in the environment they're placed and they're becoming less less physical coaches and as we've discussed the whole like last hour it's you know well-being is a big part of that um you're in their lives uh, you're a part of their lives and you're training them you know mentally physically and so it is also important you know put it on the snc coaches as well to make sure they're a little bit more educated in the well-being side of things and maybe going to getting some accreditations in in that side of things you know they don't want to be looked at or giving out advice as a fully fledged, you know, psychologist, psychiatrist, but to have the tools to be able to deal with conversations better, I think is probably a big opportunity uh, as well for SNC coaches. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We've got a, a good, I like this question about traveling. Um, You you guys would travel a lot, obviously in in the collegiate world, moving around the country. So uh, this is from Matt Palmer from uh, uh, Aussie rules team over here. What do you perceive as the perfect, away game prep this might be a bit of a loaded question but at home games players would arrive at the game in their own time after having a free morning day um do you think snc coaches try too hard to fill the time before a game with mobility and activation sessions whilst away uh and what are some of like the habits that you have um, on game day while on tour how do you best set them set them up I think it's a great question. I, I I would probably say that I'm not the best person to answer because we're so much of our travel is defined, you know, by just mm. schedule and and um, ops and, and things along those lines. But, I mean, I think typically what we try to do we call about we talk about the critical 48, the 48 hours leading up to the game day. Mm. Um, it's very important for us. So we're talking, you know, sleep preparation. We're making adjustments based off the time that we're playing, um, and we're we're given tons of educational content we've got the aura ring and some things like that that we're really trying to promote Mm -hmm. sleep at a certain time so that way we're optimized for you know that that if we're traveling time zones um those types of things we'll do the blue blockers when we're traveling time zones as well yeah Uh, if it's too much if it's east coast game you know then we're we're going two days prep you know ahead of time if it's if it's a typical game in our own time zone we're, we're going one day ahead as soon as we get off the plane, we're doing some sort of mobility right away. As soon as we get to the air, to the hotel, um, it's the first thing we do. Um, we do have the ability at places to do a little, like a little um, prep work, you know. And so, if we can get into a weight room near where we're at, or we'll bring some stuff along. Uh, we have a chop shop that we we call it the chop shop, car wash, whatever you want to call it. You know, the night, you know, as they're going to bed. So we're having all of our trigger point guns and all of our self my fascial release techniques and you know, things along those lines with the game day we get them active right away depending on if it's a night game or if it's a, if it's a morning game we get them doing something right away uh, so again some more mobility some walkthroughs outside we try to get out in daylight as quickly as we can um and then four hour before the game is when we start kind of our you know pregame meal, all of our prep work, you know, going in and uh, early outs, individual outs, um, you know, our warm up and, and then game day. So, and then we start the whole process of recovery on the way back. We don't wait. We don't wait until we get back. I mean, we, we're making sure that we're putting compression garments on or, we're, we're, you know, using Norma Tex as, as we can. Got the trigger got point guns on the plane. Um, we're doing as much stuff as we can on the way back. 
um, to make sure that we're um, we're taking advantage of whatever that travel time is. Yeah, I think again, it's a very individual process for some. You know, what works for one doesn't work for the other. But you probably got the key key um, influences being you know just getting that sleep and nutrition right before the game and keeping that consistent for away games the same as home games and and trying to keep really you know i won't put a percentage on it because i don't uh, i'm not an expert but it's a a lot of a mental game as well um you know just getting keeping the athletes relaxed um whatever you do whether you do that with humor whether you do that with some you know unconventional techniques it doesn't have to be all scientific um or tech but i think a good good mix of those things where you're doing the recovery right you're doing the sleep and nutrition right but then you're also uh you're also you know you're also treating them as individuals and figuring out what works for for them and, and making them most comfortable i think um we might do uh we might do one more question and then we might have to uh get those other questions answered over the next few days but um I like this one from Justin, Justin Leach. Uh, he reckons you're looking good, just like Nick Stelly. So that's, you look like you got a good camera there, I think, Ron, maybe. I don't know. You, you're getting oh, no. lots of compliments. Yeah, so, yeah. It's for radio. Uh, <laughs> what's, uh, what's, talk about a little about your process in developing coaches. You've been around uh, long enough now. Um, how do you, how do you sort of uh, attack that? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we bring in a lot of, of young coaches. I think, um, I think there's, again, I think I see this a lot right now with a lot of coaches coming out with a lot of credentials, a lot of degrees, but haven't had the practical experience that really matches up with what you need to do to be able to, to, you know, when you're, when the bullets are flying. And so, um, we bring our interns in, they go through, what we call it university McKeefree for a week. They go through you know, <laughs> what we're doing. Not like um, what you hazing. Yeah, we and we you know we make them go through the workouts. Yeah, and our guys go through, and you know it's easy to freaking cuss and yell and scream at somebody and when they're puking and tell them to get back in unless you've gone through that and then you're like you yeah. have a different perspective, you know. And so, um, so they go through it. Um, you know they they go through the split on the front end of the week, then they turn around. They have to take each other through the split on the back end of the week. Um, mm. we, we they we put them at each rack, and then we have a position strength coach that manages you know three to four racks and so they have a, a resource right there to be able to, to draw upon uh in that setting but it also but they're responsible for those four athletes and so that 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 kind of ownership and getting in there and, and rolling your sleeves up i think that practical experience of kind of throwing being thrown into the fire really really helps them develop because they start to learn that you know i can't talk about sarcomere and you know the krebs cycle you know, to these athletes, they don't care. You know, they, they you got to be able to, 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 you know, genius is taking the complex and making it simple. And, and so, you know, learning, learning the tricks of the trade. Um, and then we, you know, we, we try to put them up in front of the group as much as we can. We try to, you know, give them as much ownership as we can. We find, you know, they go through a whole curriculum of, of lectures and practical, we call them labs where they're, you know, they're going through and they're, they're getting on our VBT and they're, they're learning all the ins and outs of that. They're learning our, our GPS and, and all the different tech that we got and all the, you know, all the different progressions and regressions we have for our Olympic lifts and our kind of our core moments. And so uh, it's a pretty comprehensive internship program, uh, but with a lot of like hands-on experience, which I think is super important. And then tapping into a network that we've been able to create over 20 plus years of doing this being able to tap into that network to be able to move them on to additional roles and keep them growing uh, in the in the lifespan of a strength coach allows me to bring back really really qualified high you know the people that know how to work with me which is not the easiest thing to do um, <laughs> you know bring back people that know how to work with me but also if, if can bring something back to the table and build upon what they learned here yeah I think um throw them in the deep end, do some hazing, get them to walk the walk. The University <laughs> Coach Mac might have to be a TV show or uh, something like <laughs> yeah, that's, that. Uh, <laughs> that's probably a horror movie for, for most. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, PTSD for some of those uh, GAs. But I think you're right. Like you, you, the success is really seeing them go on to a, you know, a really big opportunity and then potentially seeing them come back at some point 
and working with them again, um, I think would be a really nice, you know, closing of the circles, uh, if you want to call it that. But I think we might have to call it there. Um, we'll get, uh, this will all be sort of recorded. So we'll, we'll send that out and uh, we can get to some of the other questions and maybe Ron can answer them in, a, in, in some text and we can send that out as, as well. But really appreciate all the attendees jumping on and especially to you, Ron, for, for giving up your time with your, your long 14 hour days. And I know you got some family you want to spend time with. So I really genuinely really appreciate you jumping on again and um, having the chat. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, likewise. I think so much for doing this. I think anytime you put these types of resources out, I know the amount of work that goes into that. So yeah. um, if anybody is, uh, wants to reach out, feel free. I'm, I'm an open book. If you're ever in the Seattle area, you want to come watch a training session. Uh, super important. I think the proof's in the pudding, right? You got you to gotta, you see it live to, to appreciate what we do. But um, but yeah, I'm you know, at Army Key Free on all the social media platforms and uh, happy to help any way I can. Yeah. Maybe we'll send out a bit of a, a book link purchase uh, plug maybe as well, if you want to. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good, it is a good read. But uh, yeah, I think we'll, hopefully we'll be over in the States, um, you know, in July this year. So uh, we'll have to come by, swing past and, and say hello from, you know, from the Lumen Sports team. It'd be great. Good stuff. All right. Thank you, Ron. Uh, we'll chat to you soon. Thanks, guys. Have a great one. See ya.